July 26, 1944, 8.45 a.m. 12 checker tail P-51 Mustangs knife through the crisp Alpine air near Graz, Austria. They're 7,000 feet above a formation of bombers. First Lieutenant Art Fiedler has the number four slot in a flight of four. We were long range bomber escort. When we flew the 51, we could fly at least 650 miles. Fiedler settles in for another uneventful five hour mission. Pilots call them milk runs. But just minutes into the mission, Fiedler spots something strange. I look down to the left and I see the most incredible formation I have ever seen. I see eight airplanes flying, line abreast, almost wingtip to wingtip. And there's not only one row, there are eight rows of them. There are 64 airplanes. This is a fantastic formation. Fiedler calls out the bogeys. Somebody said, they're P-51s. And I said, how can they be P-51s? I never saw 51s fly in a formation like that. Within seconds, Fiedler's worst fears are realized. The mystery planes are Falk Wolf 190s, Germany's most advanced piston engine fighter. Their 30 millimeter cannons lay waste to the bombers. At this particular juncture, I said, they're bogeys and they're hitting the bombers, I'm gone. Fiedler pitches up and dives to the left to position himself behind the bloodthirsty Falk Wolf formation. I decide that if I shoot at the lead row of them, if I can hit any of them and have them pull up, that we can break the formation up and they'll stop shooting at the 17th. Fiedler manages to break up the formation. He pulls hard back on the stick. The agile Mustang responds smartly. But as he pulls up from his attack run, he's met with a horrifying sight. There are 17s falling, pieces of them are falling. I see a B-17 roll over on its back, start down and spin. Second spin, the tail came off of it. There's at least 20 shoots. I've got to be careful where I'm going. I don't want to run into anybody. Fiedler rolls away from the carnage, then spots a lone FW-190. Fiedler is here. The 190 is here, just 200 yards off his nose. Fiedler banks easily onto the German's tail and closes in for the kill. Suddenly, the 190 knifes hard right. Fiedler loses the bandit in the chase. Well, there's some kind of a timing in combat that I don't know how to explain, but I knew that he should have appeared and he didn't. I let him get out of my sight. That's the mistake. Suddenly, the Falk Wolf screams in, head on. Uh, boy, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Here came the Falk Wolf straight up at me with his wings flashing fire and fire off of the nose. The 190 pitches down into a steep dive. Fiedler noses over and maneuvers his P-51 behind the German. The two planes plunge earthward, 600 feet every second. Below the clouds, the rugged peaks of the Austrian Alps stretch out before them. The German noses up steeply into a climb. We are pulling G's 
like nobody's business. I am screaming as loud as I can and I'm tightening my stomach muscles. These are all things that are supposed to stop the blackout or at least give you more tolerance for it. Fiedler claws for altitude. I am astounded to see him coming straight down at me and he's shooting at me. Somehow, the German has managed an impossibly sharp reversal. It's a maneuver that no pilot should be able to handle. When he's coming down at me, I think, how the hell could he possibly go from straight up to straight down? And it seems like in just a couple of seconds. And that's exactly what was going through my mind. How is this possible? Fiedler reverses and pursues his foe, closer and closer to the deck. They are hurtling earthward at over 450 miles per hour. Again, the FW-190 leads Fiedler through a crushing high-G pullout. When you pull G's, it's just like a curtain comes down over your face and you can have that curtain go up or down by releasing the pressure or putting more pressure. Now you can still hear, you can still talk, you're still aware of what's going on, but you're blind. So you haven't passed out yet, but you can't see. As Fiedler releases pressure on the stick, his vision returns, revealing the 190 boring in from above, guns blazing. Fiedler is stunned. This German is almost superhuman. The diving Falk Wolf whistles past Fiedler's canopy. With dogged persistence, Fiedler again gives chase. The dogfight has descended from 24,000 feet to barely 500 feet. As the airspeed passes 400 miles per hour, both pilots are an instant from oblivion. Art Fiedler has just entered an arena where there's no room for error. Low-level dogfighting is the last resort of a fighter pilot. Down on the deck, everything changes. Low-altitude dogfighting, low-altitude maneuvering, is much more difficult and demanding because your lookout has to be divided now between the ground, which is a threat, and the enemy, which is also a threat. The slightest mistake sends an aircraft careening into solid ground. And with the vertical dimension eliminated, options are limited. You're taking out a whole realm of options that either pilot has to do, whether it's using altitude to get down to bug out of the fight or to be able to use the altitude in order to regain airspeed. All of that goes away. Pilots must have a solid grasp on how their plane performs down on the deck. The pilot that knows how to utilize the weapons on his aircraft and its performance down low is going to win. Art Fiedler's P-51 Mustang is the Air Force's premier high-altitude escort fighter. But it turns and climbs quickly on the deck, where the thicker air enhances maneuverability. The German FW-190 is heavily armed with a strong airframe, the most fearsome fighter in the Luftwaffe's arsenal. Down in the weeds, the P-51 is faster, but the Falk Wolf has heavier guns and can turn tighter. Both planes have unobstructed canopies, providing excellent all-around visibility. During a wild chase to the deck, Art Fiedler has witnessed an FW-190 pilot performing impossibly difficult maneuvers. Now, Fiedler's locked on his tail in a high-speed pursuit through a mountain pass. I'm about 400 yards and I'm getting close enough to ready to start shooting at this guy. I remembered the advice that I had gotten from this World War I fighter pilot. 
that the easiest time to shoot an enemy airplane down is when he's trying to shoot one of yours down. So every time you're getting ready to shoot at an enemy airplane, be sure you check your tail. Fiedler looks over his shoulder. Sure enough, another Falk Wolf is diving on him. Fiedler comes to a stunning realization. His enemy wasn't superhuman. Fiedler's been fighting two FW-190s the whole time. Now the second 190 closes in for the kill. July 26, 1944. Lieutenant Art Fiedler is just 400 feet above the ground, bracketed by enemy fighters. He's got four 30 millimeter cannons pointed at the back of his head with a split second to react. He can't dive. At 400 miles per hour, he'd hit the ground in less than two seconds. If he banks in any direction, the 190s will easily get on his tail. Fiedler will barrel roll throwing off the Germans' aim while simultaneously slowing down enough to drop in behind the diving 190. Fiedler raises the Mustang's nose while pushing the stick over. The white-tipped Alps roll over his head as he drops into the Fock Wolf's 6 o'clock. Payback time. Well, I put my pipper out in front of him and started firing. Fiedler hoses the German plane down with his 650 caliber Brownings. The FW-190 tumbles out of control. And he crashed right there beside that barn. Scratch one for Fiedler. But the first Fock Wolf is somewhere up ahead. Fiedler goes balls to the wall, fighter pilot slang for pushing the rubber balls on the throttle handles against the firewall. Nearly 1,700 horses of his Rolls-Royce Merlin engine are turned loose. So I keep going down the valley at full speed. I guess I travel about a minute and a half and the canyon turns off to the left, and of course I follow the canyon, and we now come to a wide expanse, and as I start looking around, I look at that mound, and here comes an airplane right at me. Fiedler is here. The mystery plane is across the valley, here. First, I think, oh, there he is. <laughs> He's coming at me. Fiedler prepares himself for another knockdown, drag out fight. But then, a friendly voice crackles through the radio. And it says, if that's a P 51 coming towards me, waggle your wings. Well, I waggle the wings, of course. It's Bill Lowry, a squadron mate of Fiedler's. The two Mustangs form up and search the skies for targets. Suddenly, Lowry dives for the deck. As I look down there, I see a trail of black smoke from as far to the right as I can see, right down below us and at the head of it's an ME-109. A wounded German ME-109 flying just above the ground. Lowry saddles up for an easy kill. He presses the trigger, and I guess the guns fire about three rounds, and he's out of ammunition. So he pulls up here, and he says, he's all yours, you lucky SOB. But he didn't say SOB. <laughs> Fiedler slides in behind the German. I'm pulling up kind of slow on this 109 who's still going balls to the wall and smoking black smoke. This low to the ground, a single miscalculation is fatal. 
Lowry is sitting up here and he's yelling, shoot, shoot, shoot. And I'm saying, hold your horses, hold your horses. Fiedler closes to 250 yards. The panicked German elects to bail out 10 feet off the ground at nearly 400 miles per hour. His body impacts the ground and bounces. Fiedler witnesses the gruesome sight. This is incredible. The second bounce looks like he's bouncing right over my wing. In the third bounce, he bounces right into the wreckage of his ME-109, which is smashed into the ground and is now a rolling ball of fire. Ah, this was not a pleasant uh, experience to see somebody killed like that. I, uh, I, 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 we have always expected that the air-to-air -air combat is machine against machine, and we don't normally get to see the blood and the guts, so this was pretty much of a shock. Fiedler climbs to altitude and heads back to base. He has scored his fourth and fifth victories. Fiedler is an ace, but the achievement is bittersweet. Six days before I'm 21 years of age, I suddenly become an ace, and I have had this unpleasant experience of seeing a human body uh, bouncing along the ground. I never had to experience that again. And you eventually get to the point that you regain your feeling of bird against bird. Art Fiedler has experienced the harsh reality of low-level dogfighting in World War II. In the Korean War, the advent of jet power doubled the speed of the dogfight. At low level, the difference between life and death is measured in fractions of a second. Only the most determined and skilled jet jockey will take the fight down to the deck. May 15, 1952. Four F-86 Sabre jets streak toward the Chinese border. Ground control, or GCA, has vectored the Sabres towards a flight of MiG-15s. But without warning, the MiGs disappear from the radar scope. Element leader Captain Jim Kassler has a hunch he knows where they are. American radar can't detect MiGs below 15,000 feet. The enemy is probably at low level, headed for an airfield at Antung, China. Breaching Chinese airspace is strictly forbidden. But with three MiG kills under his belt, Kassler is confident and aggressive. I broke off for my flight leader. I just broke off on my own and dove back toward Anton. Kassler and his wingman, Albert Smiley, scream across the Yalu, entering Chinese airspace. As they near the airfield at Antung, Kassler's hunch pays off. Three MiGs on final approach to the runway. There's about uh, 9,000 feet. I looked and here are three MiGs are just pitching out over the runway. The MiG-15 is a lightweight interceptor. Its tremendous rate of climb and stratospheric service ceiling give it a slight advantage over the F-86 Sabre at high altitude. But down low, the Sabre is roughly 50 miles per hour faster, and newly added flight controls in the tail give Kassler's F-86E the edge in low-level maneuverability. 
The MiGs are here, 8,000 feet below. Kassler will split S, positioning himself directly behind the lead MiG. But it takes the Sabre at least 6,000 feet to perform the maneuver. Many aircraft have done split S's at low altitude and actually impacted the ground. So it's a little bit of a gamble. But Kassler is confident. When they questioned my mind, I could uh, fall in behind this guy. I just timed it just right. Kassler pulls out at 500 feet, with the MiG just 400 yards ahead. He pulls the trigger. in the flames and so I just rode up beside him and looked at him and he was sitting in a pool of flame in the cockpit. Another MiG has maneuvered behind Kassler. Kassler is here. The second MiG is here in perfect firing position. But Kassler's wingman, Albert Smiley, has the drop on him. Smiley streaks in, unleashing a torrent of 50 caliber machine gun fire. A second MiG flames and drops out of the sky. Then, in the blink of an eye, the tables turn. Kassler sees the third MiG swing in behind his wingman. Tracers engulf the American. It was a big fiery daddy, probably about 600 feet behind him. Kassler and Smiley are in a lethal dilemma. Down in the treetops at over 500 miles per hour, one false move could kill them both. May 15, 1952. Captain Jim Kassler's wingman is in dire straits. A MiG-15 is closing on his six o'clock. Kassler must force the MiG off his wingman's tail. Kassler will order Albert Smiley to break hard left. Kassler will break right directly into the MiG's attack. He hopes to put the MiG on the defensive. Smiley breaks left. Kassler snaps right. The move works. The MiG heads for the airfield with the Americans in hot pursuit. They're as low as you can go and still fly, you know, so I'd say 50 feet. Communist anti-aircraft fire rips through the sky. But incredibly, no one is hit. Pilot keeps running. He's heading for the coast. The smartest thing he could have done was turn and fly deeper into China, you know. There was another base, another base uh, about uh, 50 miles away. A wild chase through the treetops begins. The MiG maneuvers violently, desperate to keep the American from getting a shot. But Kassler won't be denied. His Sabre's gun ports flash in anger. After I hit him the first time, then I knew I was going to get him. I didn't care how long it was going to take me. I wanted to get that kill. The chase wends its way to the coast. The mountains give way to mud flats and a thick layer of fog. The Korean coast runs out about a, at least a mile out. It emanates fog. One of the things you have to contend with are all the interaction between the actual ground and the sky. 
you have fog, you've got haze. It just makes it that much harder to fight down there. The MiG pilot must shake his pursuer. He'll pull up, go inverted, and loop back around, hoping to lose the American. But this low, with fog obscuring the ground, the slightest error would be fatal. The MiG pilot yanks the stick back. Kassler follows him through the dangerous maneuver, firing bursts the whole way. So I just getting ready to pull the trigger again, and he went splat and hit the mud. A geyser of mud and water explodes into the air. Startled, Kassler chops power, pops his speed brakes, and buries the stick in his gut. I just thought I'd buck for him, you know, really. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was pretty close to him when he splatted. The saber shudders as he clears the column of mud. Kassler has got a guardian angel on his shoulder. He got lucky and pulled out, and the MiG did not get lucky. Kassler returns to base at Kimpo. The maneuvering kill makes him an ace. I don't think I cleared the mud more than 10 feet. For that mud to splash that high and, and uh, me run into it, I get awful close. The mud caked to the bottom of his F-86 is a grim reminder of how close he came to death. In the Korean conflict, as in World War II, the need to maneuver in close and maintain airspeed would always draw dogfights down toward the ground. With the appearance of air-to-air -air missiles in the 1960s, dogfights at any height, let alone hugging the ground, were supposed to be relegated to history. But Vietnam would prove otherwise. May 20th, 1967, eight F-4 Phantoms of the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing thunder into the hostile skies of North Vietnam. Wing Commander Colonel Robin Olds leads the mission. Olds is the quintessential fighter pilot, a double ace with 12 kills in World War II and another two so far in Vietnam. I was going up the Gulf of Tonkin and talked to the kid in the back seat. They were going to go in to the Northeast Railroad, and I think today's going to be a big day. Sure as hell was. Old's backseater is 25-year-old Lieutenant Steve Croker. I felt very confident. First of all, Robin Olds was an incredibly capable airman. I mean, not just by reputation, but you could tell right away by flying with him that the guy had great hands and, and this great visual situational awareness. The Phantoms escort a strike package of F-105 Thunder Chiefs, or THUDs. Olds and his men are perched 3,000 feet above them. Suddenly, 15 miles from the target, the telltale flash of metal. Olds and Croker are here, above the fighter bombers. Eight MiGs are here at 8 o'clock. Another eight MiGs are here at 2 o'clock. The North Vietnamese are attempting a classic pincer move. Olds will lead one flight towards the MiGs at 2 o'clock. He orders the other flight of Phantoms towards the MiGs at 8 o'clock. Olds' flight of four bores in on the formation of MiGs. About the time we were breaking into the MiGs, the first thuds that had hit the rail yard had broken, the ones on the northern target had broken off and made a right-hand turn, and were literally coming back through our formation. The Phantoms roar through the 105s. Olds yanks back on the stick to avoid a mid-air collision. The sudden maneuver takes Croker by surprise. I literally got 
pressed down onto my knees, so I was bent forward because the G-force was so high. I wasn't really prepared for it. I didn't have my shoulder harness locked because if you locked your shoulder harness, you couldn't really look. The near collision has disrupted Old's attack. To their horror, MiGs are now behind them. The Americans break, but the lead MiG centers his sights on Olds and Croker's wingman, Dick Van Loan. You could see the shells coming over the cockpit, and I was talking to Colonel Olds the whole time, telling him he's still back there shooting at us. 23-millimeter projectiles rip through Van Loan's Phantom. The F-4 can't take the punishment. Both crewmen punch out. For the first time in Robin Old's combat career, a wingman won't be coming home. He can't dwell on the loss. There are more MiGs, and they've tasted blood. May 20th, 1967. Robin Olds and backseater Steve Croker have just lost a wingman. Now a MiG is at their six o'clock. I had flown about 80 missions in North Vietnam, but I had never encountered anything of that magnitude. We've been shot at by SAM, shot at by AAA, shot at by airplanes but never a large force-on-force -force engagement. Olds quickly rolls into a diving left turn and punches the throttles. The big Phantom sprints out of cannon range, leaving the MiG behind. Within seconds, Olds tallies another MiG-17 off the nose. Olds is in perfect position for a radar-guided Sparrow missile shot. He called and said, there's somebody right in front of us. Lock it on, lock it on. Croker readies the missiles, peering into the hood of the radar scope. Lock on. Olds pushes the button, ripple firing two AIM-7 Sparrows. The first missile is a dud. But the second fires straight and true at four times the speed of sound. the wreckage. But suddenly, tracers flash around Old's canopy. More MiGs on his six. He breaks hard left. The MiGs can outturn the heavier F-4 and start to pull lead. Old's knows he can't win this fight. He levels the wings, then pulls vertically. The Phantom's twin engines leave the MiGs in the dust. The North Vietnamese bug out, heading for the sanctuary of nearby Kep Air Base. They'll form two rotating circles called wagon wheels just over the air base. They're hoping to lure the Americans into a turning fight down on the deck where the MiG-17 excels. What they would do is fly over their aerodrome periodically and then off to one side. The other guys would fly over the aerodrome and off to the other side, and they had mutual protection. Old's flight of phantoms joins up over Kep. Although he's aware of the risks of engaging MiG-17s at low level, Olds takes the bait and leads the charge. Low-level engagements in Vietnam are uncommon. Americans avoid this domain primarily because early air-to-air -air missile tracking systems are prone to error. Terrain features play havoc with both radar-guided and heat-seeking missiles. 
Most of these missiles were designed to shoot down Soviet bombers, and they weren't designed to shoot down maneuvering targets in close proximity. And we had no gun, none at all. Olds and Croker must work around these deficiencies as they engage North Vietnam's most capable dogfighter, the MiG-17. The MiG-17 is older than the F-4, but remains a formidable foe. It bristles with three lethal cannons, twin 23 millimeters and a single 37 millimeter. The Phantom's two J-79 turbojets give it the advantage in speed and rate of climb. But the subsonic MiG-17 can turn tighter than the F-4 at any altitude, especially in the dense air near the ground. Tactics against the MiG-17 was mainly the cut and slash. Blow through them, turn around, come back. Coordinated with other guys. Keep them boxed in, if you could. But don't ever try to turn with him. The F-4s slash through the wagon wheel, refusing to be drawn into a turning fight. Olds angles for a shot with his heat-seeking sidewinder, but can't get good tone. So you could just wave at him as you went by, basically. As you, were, you know, and then come back and try and get another shot. The MiGs fire on the F-4s as they pull away. Then drop back into the wheel. As he zooms above the airfield, Old spots a lone MiG right down on the deck between the two wagon wheels. I saw a lone MiG down low, and I figured he was the lead. They are doing figure eights. Old suspects that the MiG is the brains of the operation. If he's taken out, the others will scatter. Olds tells Croker to hold on and makes his move. May 20th, 1967, over Kep Airfield. Robin Olds and backseater Steve Croker are making slashing attacks against a low-level formation of MiG-17s. One is apparently directing traffic. As prime a target as the MiG leader is, a glance at the fuel gauge decides the matter. Olds reluctantly orders the F-4s to depart, with himself and Croker bringing up the rear. Made one turn to make sure everybody left and headed for the coast. I thought about that lone MiG. I said, <laughs> Croker notices Olds doing some quick calculations. He must have calculated what it would take to get back, go after this guy for a time or two, and then he figured he could get back to the tanker. Olds suddenly reverses direction, breaking formation and diving for the deck. No matter what it takes, that MiG is going down. Olds recovers 50 feet above the treetops and firewalls the throttles. Flying at high speed and low altitude is one of the most exciting things you can do in an aircraft. The aircraft is very tight. It feels very controlled. There's quite a bit of ground rush as, as uh, objects are coming by you, but it feels like an ultimate roller coaster ride. Approaching Kep Airfield, Olds sees that only the MiG leader remains airborne. The other MiGs have landed. The North Vietnamese pilot sees the big phantom barreling towards him. Then he very quickly turned and headed down into the weeds and to try and escape. The chase is on. The roar of the phantom's twin J-79 engines echo through the hills. Steve Croker keeps his head on a swivel. Now because Robin Olds doesn't have a wingman at this point, it's even more important that his backseater is checking their own six so that Robin Olds can then concentrate on shooting this guy and also flying low to the earth like that. 
The MiG throttles up full afterburner. Olds tries to lock on with a heat-seeking sidewinder. I think he knew I was back there because he was just weaving all over the sky, but very, very low. I couldn't fire at him because of the heat coming up from this field. The trouble with jungle is you get heat returns from that just like you do for an airplane. So either on the radar or the heat-seeking missile, we couldn't break out the MiG. Olds maneuvers skillfully, but he can't get the MiG locked up. The Sidewinder needs to track the MiG against clear blue sky to lock on. He was of the opinion that if we could ever get beneath the sky and he had to pop up, we could hose him. Fortunately for Olds and Croker, a ridgeline looms directly ahead of the MiG-17. That poor young man had a three bitter choices. His choices were bail out now, run into that ridge that was right in front of him, or pull up over, over it and give me some daylight. The frantic MiG pilot reaches the end of the line. It's now or never. He pulls up to clear the ridge. Olds fires. Splash two for Olds. The 44-year-old colonel has scored the 16th victory of his combat career. Olds clears the ridgeline, dangerously low on fuel. Olds decided that probably was a good time for us to get out of Dodge. Olds and Croker managed to make it back to a tanker, barely. We were in serious trouble, and we probably had somewhere between four and six minutes of flying time left when he got on the boom. Old's bold, low-level kill vividly illustrates the challenges of a missile fight in that unforgiving environment. As technology marches forward, low-level aerial engagements will become increasingly rare. Advanced radars with look-down, shoot-down capability, combined with long-range, all-aspect missiles, means that a low-flying adversary 